Today I'm going to do something a bit different. Instead of explaining an animal myth or talking about animal behaviour, I'm going to discuss some other aspects around zoology. In this video I'm going to explain what it means to be on the IUCN Red List. That is where an animal is listed as endangered or threatened, for example. You may not have heard of the IUCN Red List before, but you will have likely seen it written down if you've ever visited a zoo or heard of an animal that has become endangered or is no longer classed as endangered, and that is where the IUCN Red List comes in. The IUCN Red List of Threatened Species is a global database created by the International Union for Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources of the Global Conservation Status of Biological Species. They use a set of criteria to evaluate the extinction risk of thousands of species of plants and animals. As of this recording, there are 98,512 different species listed on the list. Once a species has been evaluated, it is placed into a category. You probably know of some of these. Extinct, critically endangered, endangered, vulnerable, near threatened, and least concern. There are, however, more categories than this, with there being a total of nine. I'm going to try and explain to you what it means to be a species in each of these categories. Aren't they pretty self-explanatory, I hear you say? For the most part, they are. But there are some species, some less obvious things that can cause you to be on one of the group over the other. And some interesting things that mean some species can never leave a category. So let's start at the bottom of the list or the top of the list, depends on which way range you have the list. We'll start at the bottom of this list with the two categories which indicate that there is no estimation of risk of extinction, though there are different reasons for both. Firstly, not evaluated. Not evaluated is as it sounds. There has been no attempt to assess the current status of the species, and considering that the IUCN has assessed, as mentioned before, over 98,000 species worldwide, and estimates of the total number of species globally vary wildly from 3 million up to 30 million. This means it is by far the largest of these nine categories. It is important to note, however, this doesn't mean these animals should not be considered as not threatened. Next, we have data deficient. Again, species classed as data deficient have no estimation of risk of extinction. However, this time the species has been evaluated, but there is little or no data about prevalence and threats to make an accurate assessment. This can easily become a very complex issue when there could be very little data on a species due to the threats, or the little data indicates the species as being threatened. Do you then assume it is a very threatened species because you can't get any data? Or is this species incredibly secretive so data is just difficult to report on and then the species is actually doing fine because it's so secretive? For example, the Bogota Sun Angel, love that name, uh, is a species of hummingbirds known from only a single skin that was bought in 1909 in Bogota. It's unknown where it was collected from, it's thought that it was the East Andes or Central Andes in Colombia. But no other specimens are known of, but it did exist, and maybe does exist, but how do you class a species like that? Another slightly larger example is Miss Waldron's red colobus. There are no photos of this, so here's a picture I took of a king colobus uh, to give you an idea of the animal. A large species of monkey, first seen by a Miss F. Waldron during an expedition by a British museum collector in 1933. It was seen very occasionally uh, until 1978. In 2000 and 2001, hunters claimed a small number of these may be living in the southeast Ivory Coast. However, there is no conclusive evidence of this and no photos or video. And then you may have seen this one in the news quite recently, uh, the rediscovery of Wallace's giant bee. This bee, with a wingspan of two and a half inches, 3.65 centimetres, was first discovered and collected by the British naturalist Alfred Ruff Russell Wallace in 1859. But 
was then believed to be extinct until it was discovered again by an American researcher, Adam C. Messer, in 1981, who found six nests on the Bakken Islands in Indonesia. It was then assumed extinct until two specimens were found being sold on eBay in 2018, having been collected in Indonesia. Then in 2019, a single female was found living in a termite nest. The species is now listed as vulnerable, as it is believed it is restricted to lowland forests, which is now becoming under threat from oil palm plantations. Let's move on to the lower risk section of categories, starting with least concern. Again, this one is pretty self-explanatory. The species has been assessed and it doesn't qualify for any of the other groups. Your widespread and abundant species tend to fall into this category. However, this doesn't mean you can just sit back and relax. Species can be considered as least concern, but their populations can still be on the decline. For example, the common warthog, as the name suggests, a fairly common species, and it is found across much of Africa, and does quite well in a lot of these locations. However, on a whole, its population is on the decline, due to it often being the target of many people hunting for food, or the fact that they frequently get caught in snares set out to catch food, but many of these snares are forgotten. These kill tens of thousands of animals a year through bycatch, though. Bet you've only heard of that term when it's regards to fishing. Near threatened. This is the other lower risk category. This is again when a species doesn't qualify for vulnerable, near threatened or endangered. However, the current assessments show that the species is likely to qualify for the threatened categories in the near future. These species almost always have decreasing populations. With some exceptions, like the brown hyena and the white rhinoceros, both whose populations are actually increasing. But, I hear you say, I thought the northern white rhino is extinct, or at least almost. Well, yes, uh, the last male northern white rhino did die in 2018, but white rhinos as a whole are an increase, albeit slowly. The IUCN tend to consider subspecies, which the northern white rhino is, more as subpopulations of the whole species, because subspecies are a strange, not really genetically different beast, which I'll tackle later in another video. And now for the more critical categories, the threatened section of categories, starting with vulnerable. An animal is classed as vulnerable when, and this list is quite long, I'll put a bit up, a greater than half reduction in population size within the last 10 years or three generations, whichever is sooner, has occurred. For example, Indian rhinos can reproduce from the age of five, meaning three generations is 15 years. Or there is enough evidence that there will be a suspected 20% reduction in population in the next 10 years or three generations. When their extent of occurrence is less than 20,000 square kilometers or their area of residence is less than 2,000 square kilometers. This is quite an important thing to remember that the area a species lives in influences their category as I will cover later. There are less than 10,000 mature, that means of breeding age, individuals left or less than 1,000 individuals left if their population is highly restricted. And finally, after an analysis of all of this and external factors, human activities, etc., that there is at least a 10% chance that the species could go extinct in the next 100 years. Now, this is where it can get a bit muddy and interesting. An animal will be assessed as endangered once all these criteria I just spoke about are at values one quarter of what I mentioned before. I'll put up a little bit of information here, a nice little graphic. Here you get some strange occurrences, for example, the Alston's palm civet, a highly elusive species of civet, and rather strange in my opinion, but you've got to love them, they're so fantastic. So, this species has been on the red list since 1988, and only in 1996 was it first assessed as vulnerable. It has been later increased to endangered in 2015, yet all these assessments are from inferred data, as they are seldom seen in the wild, and are mostly recorded by hunters and confiscations from poachers. Again, leading to a weird issue, 
why is the species only classed as endangered, not critically endangered, when the species is mostly documented from confiscated individuals? They're clearly under, under threat. And now, critically endangered. An animal will be classified as critically endangered once the values of these criteria have decreased to half a percent. That is five thousandths of the number required to be classed as a vulnerable species. See here. Now, in my mind, this is where it gets interesting. There are some species that will never not be critically endangered, endangered or vulnerable. There are some animals that were endangered before humans came onto the scene and can never become less endangered. I give you the pygmy three-toed sloth. Cute, isn't it? This little guy is critically endangered. It lives on a small island off the coast of Panama, and in 2012, it was estimated there are only 79 individuals alive. This small little island is only 4.3 square kilometers, but there is no evidence that this species lived on the mainland or anywhere else. So this could easily be as many individuals has, has been alive at once. So in a way, it is as healthy as it can possibly be. However, at the same time, with 79 individuals, there isn't much genetic diversity, so a single disease could wipe out the entire species. And an island that small means a strong cyclone could also do the job. So this species will always be endangered, even with the best conservation efforts, and even if we weren't here. And finally, to the sad conclusion, the extinct section of categories. Extinct section? How can there be more than one category for extinct? Well, here you go. Extinct in the wild, as the name suggests, extinct in the wild means the only known populations are in captivity or under human curation outside of their natural range. And none naturally occur after exhaustive surveys have been done in their natural range over the lifespan of an individual of the species. And as of recording, there are currently only 69, <laughs> 69, uh, 69 species of plants and animals classed as extinct in the wild. If they're only found in zoos now, surely they're as good as extinct, I hear you ask. What a good question, and wow, you're a very, very, very talkative laptop. Well, actually no. There are quite a few species that have been successfully reintroduced into the wild thanks to efforts of zoos and brought back from the brink of extinction, such as the Chevalsky's horse, the Scimitar oryx, the Pierre David's deer, and most recently, the Hawaiian crow. And finally, the last category, I'm sure everyone knows what this is, say it with me now, extinct! The IUCN called an animal as extinct once the surveys have been done in their natural range over the period of an individual's lifetime and found nothing, as well as the unfortunate instance that there are no remaining individuals under human care. Occasionally, extinct species have been known to reappear, which is great, out of nowhere, and these are often called Lazarus species, after the character in the Bible that Jesus raises from the dead four days after his death. That's the death of Lazarus, not the death of Jesus. Um, probably the most famous of these would be the coelacanth, or more recently you could consider the Jackson's climbing salamander and the Ferdandina Galapagos tortoise, or as I've mentioned before, Wallace's giant bee as a Lazarus species. The IUCN Red List of Threatened Species is a fantastic resource and an aid in the conservation of species. It is also a great visual representation of the risk of extinction any species faces to help educate people. However, it isn't as clear-cut as you might think, and it isn't exactly a list where your goal is to get off of it at some point. Some species will always be at incredible risk no matter how perfect a world we live in. I hope this video has helped maybe shed some light on the meaning of endangered and all the other labels, and maybe you maybe interest you into looking more into some species of animals on this list. Bye. Thanks for watching. I hope this video enlightened you on some stuff. And if you like it, why not give it a like and share it with your friends. Maybe they'll be interested too. And subscribe, ring the notification bell so you'll always be up to date whenever I post a new video. And just show your support, leave a comment, do whatever. Bye.